This is part two of the lecture for the muscular skeletal system medications. We're going to go over foundational pain medications and anti-inflammatory medications. I'd like to briefly um, start out by explaining what happens when we have pain to help you understand how some of these pain medications work. I feel like by understanding how a medication works, then many times the side effects, they make sense. They're not just a random set of symptoms that you're trying to understand or memorize. So here we go. I hit my thumb with a hammer. So the pain receptors in my thumb release a chemical called arachidonic acid. Meanwhile, in my body are many enzymes, and two of those are slow oxygenase or we call them COX for short. These enzymes are all over our bodies and they do many functions. One job of COX-1 is to help maintain the normal lining of our stomach. It's also involved with kidneys and platelet function. COX-2 is present at the site of inflammation. So COX and arachidonic acid combine and they create prostaglandins. With these prostaglandins, three things happen. We have pain, we have inflammation, and fever. So does it make sense that many of our medications target COX, which interferes with prostaglandin production? So these medications can relieve pain, inflammation, and fever. So think again about the functions of COX. Can you think of any side effects that might happen if COX is inhibited? Salicylic acid originally came from the white willow tree bark, and although bitter tasting has been used for centuries, around 1900, a simple chemical modification changed it to acetyl salicylic acid to make it more palatable, and it became commercially available. Salicylic acid, or aspirin, inhibits COX-1 and COX-2, so prostaglandin synthesis is inhibited. Aspirin is used for analgesia, for pain, antipyretic for fever, anti-inflammatory for inflammation, and also is an antiplatelet to prevent heart attacks. Since COX is inhibited, we must watch the patient for GI upset and gastrointestinal bleeding. Does that make sense? Remember what COX-1 does. Renal and liver damage can also occur with long-term use of these medications, and they're not to be used in children because of the potential of Reyes syndrome. Aspirin toxicity signs are tinnitus, or ringing in the ears, headache, and confusion. It's important to note that aspirin can be added to narcotics, too, for pain relief. Lortab is one of those medications that has aspirin and hydrocodone. The maximum daily dose of aspirin is 4 grams. I want to take a moment and just explain what Reyes syndrome is. Reyes syndrome is a rare but a very serious condition that causes swelling in the liver and severe increase of pressure in the brain. Unless this disorder is diagnosed and treated, death is common, often within a few days. Reyes syndrome most often affects children and teenagers recovering from a viral infection, most commonly the flu or chickenpox. Research has established a link between Reyes syndrome and the use of aspirin and salicylate-containing medications, over-the-counter, and topical use products. You would be surprised to know all the products that have salicylates in them. Some of these products are sunscreen, products for acne, bath products, deodorants, dental products like toothpaste and mouthwash, hair products, skin moisturizers, and soap. When you look at the ingredients of products, you can identify salicylate in many forms. NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These medications decrease inflammation, pain, and fever. So again, by inhibiting COX-1 and COX-2, that's what these medications do. We inhibit prostaglandin synthesis. These medications can be helpful to patients with disorders that we've been reviewing. NSAIDs include ibuprofen, or the brand names could be Motrin or Advil or Naproxen, and the brand name for one of those is Naproxen. 
Because COX-1 again interferes, there are again concerns with these medications for gastrointestinal bleeding and GI distress. Drowsiness, headache, constipation, and rash can also be side effects of NSAIDs. Prostaglandins also play an important part in maintaining renal blood flow in the kidneys, so renal damage and cardiac damage can occur when long-term use of these medications are happening. These medications should only be taken as ordered, and we have to closely monitor patients who have taken these medications on a long-term basis. The maximum dose of ibuprofen is 3.2 grams. It's again important to note that many times these medications are combined with narcotic analgesics for pain relief. These actually act synergistically and they create a sufficient analgesic effect with lowered narcotic doses. COX-2 inhibitors are technically an NSAID which decreases the production of prostaglandins that cause pain and inflammation. But these medications only block COX-2, which allows the COX-1 enzyme to continue to be produced to provide protection to the stomach and intestines. This decreases the risk of ulceration and bleeding. But unfortunately, these medications can increase the risk of heart problems such as MI or heart attack and stroke. Celecoxib or Celebrex is an example of these kind of medications. Because of the structural component, Celecoxib is counterindicated for use in patients who have demonstrated allergic reactions to sulfonamides. At acetaminophen or the brand name Tylenol decreases pain and fever but does not have an anti-inflammatory effect. The exact mechanism of action of acetaminophen is unknown. There are a lot of different theories about it. They may reduce the production of prostaglandins in the brain, or acetaminophen may be more centrally acting in the central nervous system. Acetaminophen is contained in many combination products, such as your cold medications, so it's important to read the labels of OTC meds. Acetaminophen is also combined with narcotics to treat moderate to severe pain. Com combination narcotics will end in SET, like Percocet or Roxacet. These two medications have oxycodone combined with acetaminophen. Your patients Norco and Vicodin contain acetaminophen and the narcotic hydrocodone. Side effects of acetaminophen include headache and nausea. Liver damage is the most serious side effect of acetaminophen and it can be fatal. Acetaminophen is broken down in the liver and it creates several byproducts. Well, these byproducts, they don't hurt us, but if the acetaminophen builds up in the liver, the pathway that eliminates these byproducts are overloaded, and then the liver must use another pathway to remove these byproducts. When this happens, a toxic compound called NAPQI is made, and that's what causes the liver damage. Narcotics are strong painkillers that suppress the central nervous system. The active ingredient in most narcotics is opium. Opioids, or opiate drugs, originate from naturally occurring alkaloids found in the opium poppy plant and are the strongest pain relievers that we have. How these medications work is really quite different from the medications that we've just reviewed. You could say that these medications don't even actually kill pain. Opioid analgesics, they work by binding to the opioid receptors, which are present in regions of the nervous system, and they block the pain signal to the brain. When these opioid agonists are in motion, our perception of pain is also altered. Opioid analgesics can be natural, semi-synthetic, or synthetic. Morphine, codeine, and fentanyl are commonly used opioids and are Schedule II, which means there's a high potential for addiction. Tolerance can also happen with long-term use. According to the Controlled Substance Schedule, heroin is an opioid that is classified as the Schedule I, which means it has the highest potential of addiction and has no medically accepted use in the United States.
As we discuss the side effects of opioid analgesics, again, we must remember that these medications depress the central nervous system. And anytime that happens, we have to watch for serious side effects. The mnemonic to remember side effects of opioids are ABC, DDD. So the first one is A is apnea, which is absence of breathing. Respiratory depression is a serious adverse effect of these medications. Next is bradycardia and watch the blood pressure. We need to assess blood pressure, pulse, and respiration prior to administration of these medications. They can cause hypotension. Next is C for constipation. There are opioid receptors in the intestine, and when those are initiated through these medications, it slows paralysis down, so constipation is a very common side effect of opioid analgesics. Last is the three Ds, dysphoria, dyspepsia, and dysuria. Dysphoria is uneasiness. You know, these medications can cause some confusion. Next is dyspepsia or abdominal discomfort. Nausea and vomiting is a very common side effect of these medications. And lastly is dysuria, which is urinary retention. There is an antidote, thank goodness, to these opioids, and that is naloxone or Narcan. All right, so now we're going to talk about one of our most potent anti-inflammatory medications, and these are our corticosteroids. Corticosteroids mimic cortisol. It's a hormone produced in the adrenal glands, and it's called the stress hormone. Cortisol influences, regulates, or modulates many of the changes that occur in our body in response to stress, including, but not limited to, blood glucose levels, immune response, anti-inflammatory actions, and water and sodium balance. Cortisol receptors are all over our body. So this medication works by suppressing the production of materials that trigger allergic immune response. Because they suppress the immune system, they actually they decrease the patient's ability to fight infection. So these medications are only for short-term use. Prednisone is one example of these medications. I have one finger here, remember number one drug. These medications end in O-N-E, like prednisone, cortisone, or dexomethasone. We will talk about corticosteroids through all of our areas of study. These medications can be used topically for skin conditions. They can be inhaled for respiratory disease. They can be given IV for inflammatory conditions or given PO. So here's a mnemonic to help remember the side effects of this important medication. And I use the letter S. Sugar, salt, sex, sad, sick, and stop slowly. So the first S is for sugar. Remember, corticosteroids increase blood sugar. You know, at the hospital, patients that receive IV corticosteroids are automatically put on AccuCheX to check their blood sugar levels. The next S is for salt. These medications can cause retention of water and salt, and they can cause edema. Weight gain is also a concern. The next S is for sex. Libido has been reported as being dramatically decreased with these medications. Next, S is for sadness. These medications can cause sadness, depression, or dysphoria, so patients need to be assessed for this. This happens because high cortisol results in levels of low serotonin and dopamine. These are neurotransmitters that profoundly affect our mood. The next S is for sick, and it's because these medications reduce the body's ability to fight infection, so patients can get sick easier. Remember, as a side note, that stress, when stress happens, our immune system is not the priority, so it's getting ready for action. So lastly, S is for stop. These medications need to be tapered down. A gradual reduction in corticosteroid dosage gives your adrenals times to resume their normal function. The amount of time it takes to taper off these medications depend on the disease being treated, the dose, duration of use, and other medical considerations. 
I wanted to bring up Cushing syndrome, and this is a disease that's caused by excess cortisol production or by use of glucocorticoids. The general physical features of these are kind of hard to miss. They can be weight gain, the patient can have a moon face, bulging eyes, and buffalo hump. These patients also may experience Well, that concludes part two of the muscular skeletal system medications. Make sure you let me know if you have any questions, bring them to the farm cafe or bring them to class.